Welcome. Um, I'm Victor Curran, and uh, I am, want to welcome you on behalf of the Transcendentalism Council of First Parish in Concord. Uh, we have uh, been around, geez, must be about 12, 13 years now, um, and uh, we do programs that uh, educate about and celebrate the men and women who made Concord uh, the home of American uh, independence and imagination. And uh, we are very happy to have uh, Julie Dobra with us this evening uh, <laughs> to talk about uh, Mabel Loomis Todd. Uh, one of the things that, that I love about teaching Concord history is that uh, I meet interesting people like Julie, and uh, often those people bring uh, ideas to these classes that I teach that enrich the learning experience for everybody and that make connections because really uh, for me, teaching history is all about making connections. <clears throat> and uh, you know, we, we love to talk about Emily Dickinson, who is a, a contemporary of the famous Concord writers that we're always going on about. Uh, but Julie is uh, going to make a direct connection uh, between Emily Dickinson, who never made it to Congress herself, uh, and uh, her circle and, and uh, the Concord Literary Circle. Uh, Julie is director of the Center for Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Studies at Tufts University, uh, where she holds faculty appointments in the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development the Film and Media Studies Program, and the Civic Studies Program. Uh, her research and writing focuses on issues of representation and diversity in children's media and media effects on children. And uh, she is also the author of the book, After Emily, Two Remarkable Women and the Legacy of America's Greatest Poet, uh, which was long listed for a Penn Bograd Award in Biography, and shortlisted for the Plutarch Award in Biography and the Massachusetts Historical Book Award. Uh, she is currently working on a project called Half the History, which tells the untold and often undertold uh, stories of women through short form biography, film, and podcast. Uh, uh, and I hope we'll hear more about that this evening. A uh, cornerstone uh, of the Half the History Project uh, is the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society and the remarkable women who ran it. Uh, there will be a Q and A at the at the end of the talk. Uh, you can use the chat or the Q and A buttons at the bottom of your Zoom screen to direct questions uh, to Julie at the end of the program. And I will be putting a link in the chat uh, to find out more about her book after Emily. So, uh, welcome, Julie. Happy to have you with us. All right, thank you, Victor. So I am going to share my screen. All right, can everybody see the screen? Just wait, Victor, you can see it? Yes, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you, and thanks to the Transcendentalism Council of First Parish for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to Anka Voss and Jesse Hopper at the Concord Free Public Library Special Collections for help with images. Um, let's see. So because my first biography focused on people who lived in Amherst, in the 19th century, and the second on people who lived for 20 years in Amherst in the late 19th and early 20th century. And the current project focuses on people who live in Concord during the same time period. I feel like I've gotten to know some of the 19th century inhabitants of these two towns fairly well. And I've been interested to see some of the ways in which they overlap. Preparing for this talk has actually been a lot of fun because it's shown me even more connections than I already knew about. What I'd like to do this evening is to tell you a bit about Mabel Loomis Todd's life and work, 
Within this, you will see that although she never lived here, Mabel's connections to Concord and some of its residents were deep and profound. Some of these were connections that she maintained throughout her life. And some, I have to say, that as her biographer, I feel were a bit more tenuous connections. But Mabel, who often described her own life in superlatives that at times stretched credulity, was not above exaggeration when it helped reinforce the narrative that she was telling. That said, with the distance of decades and the somewhat analytical eye of someone trained as a social scientist and a historian, I truly do believe that there are ways in which Mabel heard, embraced, and epitomized the transcendentalist call in her life and in her work. Now, I've come to believe that there are three main ways in which Mabel Loomis Todd was influenced by transcendental philosophy, by Concord, and by some of Concord's residents. I'll speak about each one of those this evening. First, Mabel's reverence for nature embodied the transcendentalist belief in a divine spirit in nature. Her parents and her own friendships with members of the Thoreau family would further enhance this deep appreciation for the natural world. Some of Mabel's early artwork would emanate from summer holidays spent in Concord, sketching and painting the natural beauty surrounding this town. Mabel's appreciation for Emily Dickinson's poetry, in fact, had a lot to do with Dickinson's appreciation of nature. And Mabel saw in Emily Dickinson the same kind of veneration for the environment that she herself felt. Second, in her life-changing relationship with Austin Dickinson, Emily's older brother, Mabel would embrace a somewhat transcendentalist belief that spirituality needn't necessarily come from within organized religion, but came from within oneself and could be found in different forms. Now, perhaps this was just an elaborate set of rationalizations that Mabel and Austin developed to justify their extramarital relationship. But having read many of their letters to one another, as well as Mabel's innermost thoughts as expressed in her diaries and journals, I do believe that they believed that their relationship was in some ways the corporeal embodiment of transcendentalist spirituality. And third, Mabel's environmental and civic work was in some ways rooted in the influences she had from Concord. So, let me start out by telling you why I found Mabel Loomis Todd to be such a compelling character in the first place. First, arguably the most important part of her professional life revolved around her Emily Dickinson work. Without Mabel Loomis Todd, we probably would not know the poetry of Emily Dickinson today. Second, in addition to and besides her Emily Dickinson work, Mabel did remarkable things in both her personal and professional lives, things that set her apart because they really pushed the envelope of what women of her era did. Mabel was a talented visual artist. She was an extraordinarily gifted musician who'd studied both piano and voice at the New England Conservatory. She was a writer who published more than 200 articles in all of the leading newspapers and magazines of the day, as well as a dozen books that she wrote or edited. She was a world traveler who visited more than 30 countries on five continents. She was an excellent orator and a rare female public intellectual at the time who gave talks on dozens of different topics to audiences large and small across America. And she was an environmental activist. Third, Mabel and her daughter, Millicent Todd Bingham, who became an important partner in the second round of Dickinson poetry editing and publication, had an exceedingly complicated relationship with each other. Now I can say this right on the heels of Mother's Day. <laughs> anyone who is either a mother or a daughter or anyone who knows mothers and daughters knows that even in the best of all possible circumstances, mother-daughter relationships are complicated. 
And let me tell you, Mabel and Millicent's relationship was not the best of all possible circumstances. Finally, Mabel and Millicent were each complex characters. I didn't always like them, but I always admired them. In fact, after I published my first article about Mabel Loomis Todd, I got a tremendous response that really surprised me. A lot of people were truly interested in this story, including a number of literary agents who wanted to know if I was represented. One of these agents contacted me and he was extremely interested in my work. He encouraged me to send him some materials and was seemed very excited about the possibility of representing me. He was talking international sales, even a film deal. And this was before I had written much more than a book proposal in the first chapter. But after he read what I sent him, he called me up and told me that he didn't think he could sell my book. Julie, I only sell to major presses and I don't think I can sell this book because I didn't like Mabel. I think she's an unlikable woman and that would be a hard sell. Well, I kind of felt like someone who'd been courting me pretty heavily had just told me he only wanted to be friends. <laughs> but when I got my wits about me again, I started to feel a bit indignant. Would such a thing ever be said of a male subject? Hadn't there been scads of biographies of true cads and lots of biographies of truly amazing but truly flawed men? Alexander Hamilton? Steve Jobs, Bill Clinton. There are probably a few more recent people I could add to this slide as well. And what of famous fictional characters? What would Oedipus or Macbeth have been without their tragic flaws? After all, character flaws keep characters from becoming unrealistically perfect and make them more human to us. These flaws serve to distinguish the characters and provide us with their motivation so that we can better understand them. Now, most of the advice offered to would-be biographers in a variety of sources is to avoid falling in love with your subject and to see him or her as a full human being, someone with flaws as well as with positive attributes. That's what I tried to do in telling Mabel and Millicent stories to paint portraits of them in as full and as honest a way as I could. First, a word on my process. Neither Mabel nor Millicent ever threw out a single scrap of paper in their entire lives. In fact, there are 721 boxes of primary source material at Sterling Memorial Library at Yale. These materials include decades of diaries and journals written by Mabel and Millicent, letters, papers, drafts of papers, drafts of drafts of papers, and there are more than 90 boxes of photos, glass plate negatives, and lantern slides. And those diaries and journals, well, there were more than 60 years worth of Mabel's and about 80 years worth of Millicent's there was a lot of material to go through. But this plethora of material, along with materials held at Amherst College, at Harvard, at Brown, and a handful of other archives, including the Concord Free Public Library, by the way, meant that I had almost daily insights into Mabel Loomis Todd's thoughts, actions, and sometimes her decision-making processes. I wanted to make sure that I was telling the stories of these two fascinating women's lives in ways that hadn't been mentioned anywhere else. There had never been a full length biographical treatment of either Mabel or Millicent before my book, After Emily. The only things you could find in print about them were their roles as Emily Dickinson's editors. Or the other reason that Mabel might be remembered today is her 13 year long extramarital relationship with Emily's older brother, Austin a relationship that transformed her life and the lives of everyone else in the Todd and Dickinson's families. This was the dirty little secret that everyone in the small college town of Amherst seemed to know. But as I discovered, Mabel Loomis Todd was so much more than just Emily's editor or Austin's lover. Mabel Loomis Todd was born in 1856. 
Her mother's family traced their roots directly to John and Priscilla Alden, and all the women in the Wilder family were intensely, perhaps disproportionately, proud of this matrilineal line straight back to the Mayflower. They held a belief in the primacy and importance of their Puritan heritage, and also a belief that their family came from a procession of thoughtful, intellectual, artistic, and refined individuals individuals connected to some of the most important minds of their respective eras. With this belief in their own status, regardless of financial circumstance, came an innate snobbery and a conviction that only certain kinds of people who came from certain kinds of families were appropriate to socialize with or to marry, and that many other people were in some ways inherently unequal to the Wilders and their kin. Now, this was interesting, especially in light of the fact that in four successive generations of wilder women, from Mabel's grandmother through her daughter Millicent, each one lived in economic circumstances that were somewhat compromised. But they never let that stop them from thinking that they still belonged to a social class, which, quite frankly, their finances would not have suggested. Now, here is where Mabel's first Concord connection was made. Her maternal grandfather, John Wilder, was pastor of the Trinitarian Congregational Church in Concord during the 1830s. John Wilder married Mary Wales Phobes Jones in 1826 and accepted a call to the Congregational Church in Concord in 1833. As my colleague and friend Bob Gross has pointed out, um, Reverend Wilder was one of the first Concord residents to become a member of the Middlesex Anti-Slavery Society. He worked to convert his parishioners to anti-slavery tenants and was sometimes thought to be a frequent, if anonymous, contributor to various papers on the topic of abolitionism. His wife, Mary, was one of the co-founders and first president of the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society a diverse group of women working in Concord on behalf of the abolition movement. Her stories about social activism were very influential to her granddaughter, Mabel. In fact, a number of women who were active in the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society were known to Mabel as she was growing up, including Prudence Ward, who'd given silverware to Mabel's mother as a wedding present, uh, silverware that Mabel ultimately inherited and treasured herself and Mary Merrick Brooks, of whom Mabel once wrote that she, quote, not only read Sanskrit fluently, but made cake like a princess. Mabel's mother, also named Mary, but known as Molly, grew up in Concord until her father's untimely death at age 47 from consumption, after which Mary Sr. moved the family to Cambridge. But she maintained her Concord ties, as did her children. In fact, after Molly married Eben Jenks Loomis, the couple reportedly spent part of their honeymoon in the Thoreau house. They frequently returned to Concord and after Mabel was born, brought her here as well. The Wilder family was very friendly with the Thoreaus. So friendly, in fact, that Mabel grew up believing the women whom she called Aunt Jane and Aunt Maria were blood relatives. Of course, they were not. There's even a story, perhaps apocryphal, that on a visit back to Concord, Mabel's parents, Molly and Eben, put their infant daughter into the arms of Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau, Mabel wrote, did not know which end was which. After one agonized moment, the bewildered man with a groan of relief relinquished me to the giver. Apparently, babies bore no large part in Henry's scheme of life. Evan and Henry were good friends, though. When Mabel was growing up in Cambridge, her father often brought her to Harvard, where, she later wrote, he would point out to me the entry of the ancient dormitory which led to Henry's room, enlivening my day with quaint tales of their adventures. Mabel Loomis Todd's early memories were filled with thorough inspired moments. All through my childhood, when my father wished to impress upon my mind some bit of bird or butterfly or flower lore, she wrote, he was apt to quote Henry, and incidents from their many rambles were part of my happy training. After her first few years of life in Cambridge, 
Mabel's father moved the family to Washington, D.C., where he'd procured a job working at the U.S. Naval Observatory. But summers often brought them to seek relief from D.C.'s humidity back in Concord. Mabel recalled her parents going out on the Concord River with Thoreau, and she herself remembered taking long walks and, quote, stopping at my friend Louisa Alcott's home for cheerful talks with the silver-haired philosopher, her benign father, many a happy morning we spent at Orchard House. A talented painter, Mabel's favorite subjects were the landscapes, flowers, and butterflies she carefully studied and reproduced. A file of her early sketches and watercolors from the 1870s is filled with scenes from the woods and fields around Concord. Some of these sketches she later developed into paintings or artwork that she did on other mediums, such as the screen you see here. Like Henry David Thoreau, Mabel also tried to recreate and preserve nature in her writing. A dedicated diarist who wrote every single day of her life, Mabel filled many volumes with entries in which she wrote detailed descriptions of flowers, trees, and landscapes. Indeed, many pages of her diaries are uh, also contain dried pressed flowers that she collected and wanted to save. Her reverence for nature was evident and wide ranging from her observations of the changing autumnal colors in the trees she could see from her home in Amherst to her description of the giant sequoias near Yosemite. The instant I saw these marvelous red trunks, she wrote, I knew that my soul was to be dominated as never before. In fact, one of the first pieces of writing that Mabel ever published was about time spent in Maine and her descriptions of the environment there descriptions that she shared with one Louisa May Alcott. She said that they were unusually well-written and showed two of the great characteristics of a successful writer, observation and the power of description, Mabel proudly wrote in a letter to her mother. Such, ra such rapturous dedication to the natural world was not uncommon in the Victorian era. But Mabel Loomis Todd's love of the environment was not only aesthetic or philosophically inspired by Thoreau, Emerson, and other transcendentalists who influenced her family and her early years. As she grew up, Mabel saw that humans were making significant and troubling incursions into the environment, while she was dedicated to trying to preserve it. I believe that a relatively unknown aspect and unsung virtue of Mabel Loomis Todd was her role as an early land preservationist. Her familiarity with Thoreau's writings, as well as the philosophy of John Muir, led her to believe in preserving land for its own sake. Thoreau, as you know, believed that the environment was something to be observed and revered, but that it was a shared resource that needed to be preserved. In Walden, he famously wrote, enjoy the land, but own it not. For her part, Mabel realized that in Euro-American culture, land was increasingly thought of as a commodity and that in order to save it, she actually did need to buy it. In the notes for one of the many talks she gave before women's clubs and organizations, such as chapters of the Audubon Society, Mabel wrote, trees must be cared for. Deforestation will cause our land to become depleted like the desert of old Arabia. I often wonder what she would think about climate change. Because of this, and because of her love for great trees, Mabel bought 80 acres of land outside of Amherst, and eventually an entire island off the coast of Maine, just to save them from the loggers. In fact, her daughter Millicent decided that one of the most appropriate things she could possibly do to honor her mother's memory would be to make sure that their beloved Hog Island in Maine would be preserved for all times. Millicent entered into a decades-long set of negotiations with the National Audubon Society, starting a camp for adult learners there that exists to this day, and eventually turning the island over to Audubon to be preserved in perpetuity. These negotiations culminated with a ceremony in 1960, attended not only by Millicent, but also by her good friend and environmental mentor, Rachel Carson. 
Now, it was not only Henry Thoreau and his aunts with whom Mabel felt some affinity, it was also his sister, Sophia. Sophia was 37 years older than Mabel, so it's a little hard to believe that there was any kind of real friendship between the two, at least until the time that Mabel was a teenager. And yet there is no doubt but that Sophia was influential in Mabel's life. Reflecting back years later, Mabel wrote, my childhood and early girlhood idol was Sophia Thoreau, Henry's sister, as vital and fascinating as a woman could be. She possessed as great brilliance of tongue as he ever exhibited with eyes or pen. Her strongly marked decisive face constantly reminded me of the pictured face of Dante, as well as George Eliot, whose resemblance to one another always impressed me. She possessed charm far ahead of any possible beauty, and she was the most brilliant talker I ever listened to. Mabel, in fact, referred to Sophia as the, quote, friend incarnate, or the dear, wonderful model for all girlish endeavor. Sophia once gave Mabel a brilliantly blue box with gold lettering that contained many specimens of pencils made by her father and brothers, Henry and John, telling Mabel that, quote, these are for the dear child who is already beginning to write so much and so well. Or at least this is how Mabel chose to recount this gift years later, many years later. But it is true that their relationship continued. When Mabel was a student at the New England Conservatory, Sophia visited and even stayed with her, continuing what Mabel called our halcyon times. They shared a love of music as well, and their bond remained intact until Sophia's death in 1876. Sophia even bequeathed Mabel her first editions of Ralph Waldo Emerson's books, bearing inscriptions to the Thoreau siblings. So I think you can see from the examples I've just presented that the time Mabel spent in Concord as a girl was formative for her in several ways. It introduced her to people whose immersion in writing and transcendentalist philosophy was very influential to her. It helped to develop her aesthetic and also her sense that it was important for women to become civically engaged. And it influenced her thoughts about the role of nature in our lives as well as the imperative to help preserve it. But there was, I think, another way in which Mabel's exposure to Concord and its role in developing transcendentalism that became important for her, and this was in her sense of spirituality. Now, despite having a number of forebears who were ministers, Mabel herself was not a churchgoer. She never was. In fact, her diaries are filled with statements like, I did not go to church today, or I don't believe in the things that most church people do. And yet Mabel Loomis Todd considered herself to be a very spiritual person. I find my spirit in nature, she once wrote in a lengthy musing in one of her journals, the trees are my church, the forest, my congregation. When Mabel and her husband, David Peck Todd, moved from Washington, D.C. to Amherst in 1881, after David took a job as director of the observatory and an astronomy professor at his alma mater, Amherst College, it was there that Mabel first encountered Austin and Susan Dickinson. The Dickinson family was about the closest thing to royalty in Amherst as you could get, heavily invested in the college, the church, the artistic and civic life of the town. Within months, Mabel had developed a close relationship with Austin. Within little more than a year, they had commenced a romantic and eventually a sexual relationship that would last until Austin's death in 1895. Mabel was an extremely attractive woman and she knew it. Her diaries and journals are filled with entries such as, I can't see why I should have such a power over men, young and old, but I do, I'm sure of that. Or, what is this power in me which attracts men to me so often? I am deeply grateful for the power and hope that I may use it for the good of those who succumb to it. But Austin Dickinson was in fact just a year younger than her own father. Maybe there was something a little edible going on there. 
But part of what drew the pair together was their shared appreciation for the natural world and the sense that their love was beyond the bounds of conventional love. It was, though, not in the sense that they often thought of it. They wrote one another hundreds of letters, which Mabel painstakingly preserved. These letters, as well as Mabel's detailed journal entries, delineate a relationship that they defined, in fact, as transcendent. In one journal entry from 1884, Mabel offered perhaps the fullest explanation for her love for Austin, how it differed from any other love, and why she felt it to be an almost transcendental experience for her. Quote, but the greatest proof I have ever had that I am different from the 99 others and that my girlish hope that I have something rare in me was well-founded lies in the great, the tremendous fact that I own the entire love of the rarest man who has ever lived. His nature is lofty and spiritual beyond that of anyone I ever met. Austin Dickinson has reawakened my latent wish for a nobly spiritual life. My whole soul is stirred, and I can never again be shallow or frivolous. He is heaven sent. It is beyond words. Now, it may have been beyond words, but Mabel invested many, many, many other words in trying to define this love. She went on to discuss it, her love for Austin, saying that had, had given her a new and personal knowledge of God and her certainty that because of Austin, she needed no other intermediary for spiritual insight or guidance. Indeed, their love letters to each other over the years used language that furthered the pseudo-religious fervor. They believed that their relationship was destined and that in its exquisite purity, it was above and beyond the bounds of socially accepted morality. Austin once wrote to Mabel, Conventionalism is for those not strong enough to be laws for themselves or to conform themselves to the higher law where harmonies meet. We are part of one existence forevermore. Now, I want to conclude by speaking a bit about Mabel's work editing the poetry of Emily Dickinson and how I have come to believe that here too, she was greatly influenced by her formative time in Concord and by the Concordian people and philosophies to which she was introduced early in her life. Out of all of her many accomplishments and all of her many talents, the one that Mabel herself most wished to be remembered for was her own writing. But as Polly Longsworth, whose book about Mabel and Austin's love letters first alerted me to the existence of Mabel Loomis Todd, has astutely observed, Mabel had a good enough eye for good writing to know that she herself, while a competent writer, well known in her own lifetime, would not ultimately be remembered as a famous one. Mabel, of all people, would be acutely aware of the irony that today, if she's remembered at all, it's mostly because of her work editing and publishing the work of another writer. It was not actually Austin, but in fact, his wife, Sue, with whom Mabel was friends before commencing the relationship with Austin, who first introduced Mabel to Emily Dickinson's poetry. On February 8th, 1882, a brief entry in Mabel's diary read, went in the afternoon to Mrs. Dickinson's. She read me some strange poems by Emily Dickinson. They are full of power. This is the first mention of Emily Dickinson or her poetry in any of Mabel's writings. At the time, 52-year-old Emily Dickinson had already written the majority of the 1,800 or so poems we know that she wrote during her lifetime. Contemporary analysts believe that many of the poems she wrote during this period of her life were less finished than the earlier ones. Yet despite the prodigious output of poetry, very few people were aware of its existence. Mabel became one of the only people outside of Emily's family and a few friends who knew that Emily wrote poetry at all. Sue Dickinson was also aware of her sister-in-law's great talent. During her lifetime, Emily shared at least 250 of her poems with Sue, and Sue offered Emily her comments and editorial suggestions on some of them. 
Mabel immediately appreciated not only Emily's strange syntax, unusual use of punctuation and word choice, but especially her subjects, most of which were drawn from nature. Like Thoreau, Emerson, and some of the transcendentalists, Emily seemed to invest some transcendentalist ideals into her life and poetry. She clearly kept to herself and didn't conform to others. She didn't go to church and found her spirituality outdoors. Her poetic technique involved making abstracts concrete. In much of her poetry, Emily Dickinson provides simple examples from nature that she equates with heaven and harmony, a hill, the afternoon, a squirrel, an eclipse, a bumblebee, a cricket, thunder. Through her descriptions of nature and poetry, she makes a connection between an earthly existence and a transcendent existence. I believe that as Mabel came to know more of her, the poetry of Emily Dickinson, she saw all of this and it resonated with her own beliefs. By the time Mabel arrived in Amherst, Emily Dickinson had already become a recluse, seeing few people other than her own family members and rarely leaving her own home. Mabel first heard of her as, quote, the Amherst myth. When she first got to know Austin and Susan, she began to get to know Emily through their descriptions of her. Mabel wrote in her diary, she has not been out of her house for 15 years. One inevitably thinks of Miss Havisham in speaking of her. She writes the strangest poems and very remarkable ones. She is in many respects a genius. She has frequently sent me flowers and poems, and we have a very pleasant friendship in that way. However, it's important to note that it was only in that way, because you see, Mabel never, not once, met Emily Dickinson face to face. So how, you might ask, did Emily Dickinson's poetry come to Mabel Loomis Todd to be edited? Here's the brief outline. After Emily died in 1886, her sister Lavinia discovered a cache of poetry that no one knew existed and became determined to share it with the world. The task eventually fell to Mabel, who was well known to Vinnie through her relationship with brother Austin. Vinnie knew that Mabel was energetic and ambitious enough for the job, and also that Mabel's love for Austin would make her feel compelled to take on this work. Now, Mabel was not Lavinia's first choice of an editor for her sister's poetry. Though we don't know for sure, the first choice was probably Susan Dickinson, her sister-in-law, with whom Emily had shared many poems during her lifetime. Susan, in fact, was already in possession of many of Emily's poems when Vinnie came calling with additional ones. It would later turn out that they were some of the same poems because Emily wrote many versions of many of her poems. But when Susan did not move as quickly as Vinnie wished her to on the poetry editing project, Vinnie sought another editor. That editor might have been Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, the well-known abolitionist commander of a black regiment during the Civil War, Unitarian minister and literary advocate. Emily Dickinson had sent him a number of her poems during her lifetime, but Colonel Higginson declined as well. So, twice spurned, Vinnie turned to Mabel, whom she instinctively knew would take on the project. But Mabel instinctively knew that she could not do this project alone. She could not do it without enlisting the help of someone who had deep ties to the publishing establishment, someone with impeccable literary credentials. That someone was Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Though Colonel Higginson had been unwilling to take on the task of deciphering Emily's difficult handwriting and editing these confusing poems by himself, Mabel convinced him to become her co-editor in this endeavor when she came to his Cambridge home and read him some of the poetry aloud. Was it Mabel's beautiful voice, her propensity for the dramatic that enticed him? She would later write that, quote, he was greatly astonished, said he had no idea that there were so many in passably conventional form. Emily's so-called strange cadences came alive when Mabel read them out loud. Long story short, 
Mabel and Higginson went through a complex and controversial process to edit these poems, which differed so radically from 19th century poetic conventions. Among other things, Mabel and Higginson altered word choices to make poems that scan better. They altered Emily's idiosyncratic use of punctuation and regularized the ways in which capital letters were used in poems. Perhaps most controversially, they gave titles to poems that originally bore none. Indeed, of the 1800 or so poems that Emily wrote during her lifetime, only a dozen of them were actually given titles by the poet. They published two co-edited volumes in 1890 and 1891, which went through several printings. Mabel Solo edited a third volume of poetry, which was published in 1896. Mabel also edited a two volume set of Emily Dickinson's letters, which first came out in 1894. Now this part of the story is pretty well known. Here's what's not known as well. After Austin Dickinson died, in a dispute over compensation for all of her work editing the poems, for which Mabel received a grand total of only $200 for all of her very considerable work, and her general frustration with the surviving women of the Dickinson family, Mabel took all of the unpublished letters and all of the unpublished poems, numbering about 650 of them, threw them into a chest and didn't speak of them for more than three decades. But in 1929, as the centenary of Emily Dickinson's birth approached, one summer on Hog Island, the ever publicity savvy Mabel looked up at Millicent from the hammock in which she lay and said, will you help me set it right, Millicent? You see, Maddie Dickinson Bianchi, Austin's one surviving child, had been putting out her own editions of her Aunt Emily's poetry and letters and having publishers take Mabel's name off of the older ones. To Mabel and to Millicent, this seemed an incredible injustice, further injury from the long running battle between the Dickinsons and the Todds. Mabel asked Millicent to help her bring out a new edition of the letters of Emily Dickinson to reclaim the right to define Emily Dickinson. And so with a lot of trepidation, Millicent jettisoned her own very promising academic career and retooled herself as an Emily Dickinson scholar. Millicent would end up writing four books on Emily Dickinson's life and poetry, and she received two honorary doctorates for her work. Yet with as much as she knew about the idiosyncratic style and life of Emily Dickinson, to the day that she died, Millicent Todd Bingham worried that she lacked the proper credentials and would never be considered a true Dickinson scholar within the academy. Now, Millicent should also be credited, I think, with saving the so-called scraps, the unfinished poems of Emily Dickinson's that were written on the backs of envelopes, on pieces of newspaper, even along the margins of grocery lists. The ways in which Mabel's first and later Millicent's work on editing, publishing, and promoting the poetry and life of Emily Dickinson, um, and how it shape has shape, helped to shape our image of her in all of the various modes that we continue to have today in literature, art, music, memes, on the stage and on the screen. Even though many of their decisions have since been debated and challenged, there is no doubt but that they were responsible for getting Emily Dickinson's pub poetry published and for launching an image of her as a reclusive poetic genius garbed in white. Long before the term marketing was coined, Mabel Loomis Todd instinctively understood its principles. Mabel even designed the cover of the book in a way that she believed would most appeal to women whom she correctly guessed would be the most likely purchasers of this volume of poetry. And who says you don't judge a book by its cover? The first volume of poetry sold out in weeks and quickly went through several additional printings. It's also not surprising that Mabel would have selected the image that she did for the cover a print that she herself had made of some Indian pipes wildflowers, a print that she had given to Emily Dickinson in 1881. Emily wrote Mabel a thank you note. And this is a note that I think captures both of their somewhat transcendental inspired philosophies. Emily wrote, that without suspecting it, you should send me the preferred flower of life seems almost supernatural. 
and the sweet glee that I felt at meeting it, I could confide to none. I still cherish the clutch with which I bore it from the ground when a wandering child, an unearthly booty and maturity only enhances mystery, never decreases it. To duplicate the vision is almost more amazing for God's unique capacity is too surprising to surprise. Returning back to where I began this evening, I hope that I've been able to show you many of the ways in which Concord and Concordians were influential in Mabel Loomis Todd's life and work. Let me conclude by reading you a brief section from Mabel Loomis Todd's book, A Cycle of Sunset, first published in 1910. I think this demonstrates some of the staying power of the transcendental ideas Mabel came to know much earlier in her life. She wrote, Thoreau once said he had traveled a great deal in Concord. I too will try journeys wherein the scenes shall come to me in a year's delicious wilderness of sunsets. Are there words enough? Well, Mabel tried to make sure that there were. In this book, she observed changes of light, hue, tone, and atmosphere at the end of every day throughout a year from her home in Amherst, using her talents as a writer, an artist, and even as a musician, she tried to capture bird sounds that she heard in musical ligature to explain how sunsets can feed the soul. Thank you so much, and I would be happy to try to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much, Julie. Um, so um, we have a couple of questions uh, so far. Uh, and one is, is there a connection between Mabel's family and Laura Ingalls Wilder? Her husband was Al Al Almanza Wilder. No, different family. All right. Um, here is another question. Uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson asked Emily Dickinson if she ever read Walt Whitman, and she said no. Uh, did Mabel read Walt Whitman? Uh, and um, what poetry did she read? Um, Mabel was quite a voracious reader. Um, she and she was also somebody who kept lists of all the books that she read. So um, I actually don't know the answer to whether she read Whitman, but it would be very easy to figure that out by looking at her uh, at the list of books that she read. But what I can tell you is that um, Mabel read a lot of uh, contemporary poetry, which is one of the reasons that she was very. A little, uh, she recognized that, that Dickinson's poetry was exceptional, but also that it was so wildly different from everything that was out there um, that she felt it needed significant editing uh, if it was going to be published and, and bought and sold. Um, Mabel also read a lot of fiction and she also read a lot of nonfiction. Um, this is an, an interesting thing about her. I mean, because she was married to an astronomer, um, and I mentioned that she was a world traveler. She got to, to tag along on a lot of David's uh, eclipse expeditions, which um, took him to far-flung places across the globe. And part of what Mabel did um, was to help David, who was sort of a stereotypical scientist, absolutely brilliant, um, but completely incapable of writing about what he was doing in ways that most people could understand. So Mabel learned a lot about astronomy. She read a lot about astronomy um, and she ended up writing a lot about astronomy as well. So, you know, when one looks at, at the sorts of things that she read, it to me, uh, as somebody who likes to think of herself also as a fairly um, voracious reader. I, I'm always pretty amazed at the, the sort of the depth and the scope of, of what she read. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question, uh, and that is, would you share a little bit more with uh, our 
uh, audience about uh, the Half the History Project. Mm -hmm. I would be very happy to. Um, so uh, Half the History is a project that um, we launched at Tufts about um, a little more than a year ago. Uh, it's a project that I'm doing with my colleague and good friend, Jennifer Burton, who is a filmmaker. Uh, and Jen and I knew each other you know, for a decade, and we always, we both had interests in women's history, had done things in our respective disciplines about women's history, and we always wanted to do a project together, but we never knew what that was. And then uh, about a year ago, January, I went to, came to Jen and I said, I think I know what that project might be. And that project turned out to be the Half the History Project, which is... Um, a curated digital space that archives and disseminates short form content uh, about the untold and undertold stories of women's lives using short form biography, film, and podcast. Um, as Victor mentioned in his introduction, uh, a cornerstone of Half the History is a project that we're doing now about the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society. So I have spent, um, a good part of this year, immersing myself in um, the other people who have uh, studied this and written about this, including our friends Bob Gross and Sandy Petrolinus um, and um, uh, a number of other folks. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the basement of the Concord Free Public Library <laughs> looking at what they have there and um, starting to look in other archives. And um, we have also worked with the folks at Robin's House because I think um, a part of what we're doing, this is actually a story that I learned from reading Bob Gross's the Transcendentalists in Their World, was a story of Ellen Garrison, which might be familiar to uh, those of you in Concord, but uh, even as somebody who's sort of lived next door to Concord for three decades, I didn't know, I, I shame to admit, I did not know the story of Ellen Garrison. And it's an amazing story. Um, so we decided that, that one of the things that we wanted to do was to center the story of Ellen Garrison. And uh, we will be starting this summer on a, to uh, produce a film about the life of Ellen Garrison um, that we will be shooting on location in Concord. That's exciting. That is exciting. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to that. Um, if there, I, I don't see any more questions in the Q and A or in the chat. And so, uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, no, here's a question. Uh, is the Ellen Garrison movie a documentary? Would... Um, yes and no. I mean, we're not, we are actually going to reenact part of it. So the, we'll probably have several different scenes, um, where we, we're going to start with the 1835 parade in Concord, which Ellen, desegregated, walking hand in hand with one of her white classmates. Um, and that's that scene, we think, is really um, very important in Ellen's life. It sort of set the stage for a life of teaching and uh, civic engagement. So we'll, um, we are going to be uh, having actors portray Ellen and some of the other people in her family. But we're also going to be looking for folks to be part of the parade scene. So if any of you who are listening or watching this later um, are interested in being in the parade or being, thank you, Tammy. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Um, we're working with the costumer right now so that we're going to have uh, era appropriate costumes for you. And um, we we would love to have your participation. Do we have to have an equity card? Um, well, you actually, if you have a speaking role, you are going to have to sign a, a, an agreement with with Accords Equity. But just okay. be on the side. You don't you don't need to do that. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, Julie. Uh, this has uh, 
uh, oh, shined a light on a life that not a lot of us know much about and a, a life that has a very important connection to Concord. Uh, and we're looking forward to to hearing more. As as I mentioned, uh, Julie's book is uh, in the chat. Uh, there is a link uh, uh, to more information about that book at the publisher's website. Uh, and so, um, uh, well, we'll we'll see you. We'll see you in the movies. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay. Good night.